Hi people, I've got something on my mind and sometimes I really like to fetch and to rant and I'm going to do it now. Yesterday I got, uh, well I had to go to the post office because there was a package for me which was too big for the mailbox and uh, whatever, I had to go pick it up. And when I got, I thought, well that's weird, I I haven't ordered anything and people usually don't send me boxes very often and I'm not expecting any registered mail here in France, you know, what could it be? So I went and got it and it turns out to be from an old friend, a former friend, a girlfriend in New York City who I met in 1983 when I went to go uh, I got headhunted out of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York where I was their paralegal and I got into investment banking I was a mergers and acquisitions assistant and she approached me pretty much the first day of my job and this is a totally toxic person you know, uh, I really didn't know how to deal with this and handled it very badly. Uh, she came up to me and said, You were hired to do my job. We've got to stick together. You want to have lunch? And I said, Well, yeah, maybe, okay. Uh, uh, is it your treat? And she, she looked at me and said, uh, No, not this time. Uh, and in fact, she was often a very generous friend over the next 20 years that I knew her. So I cannot fault her. But really, you know, I should have said, well, I have plans and, you know, I'll get back to you. And I should have gone in and talked to my bosses, Henry Cabot Lodge III and Barclay G. Jones III, at W.P. Carey and she used to joke that I worked for two-thirds of the company and basically this was a very very toxic employee who had a lot of bones to pick with the company and um, she told me about Kenny an employee who had died and Barbara who had said this company takes good people and chews them up and spits them out and told me all the dirt about the company which in a way is good to know but really you know I was just this young woman and I was there to do a job and I really didn't need to hear all that shit and I should have gone into my bosses at the time and said who's this employee who's asking me to lunch and saying that I was hired to replace her I mean I don't really know how to handle this you know <clears throat> when you go to a boss and admit that you're already out of your depth, it can be really dicey. And, you know, I think that I felt that I could handle it, and obviously I couldn't. And I don't know what they would have done to defend me. They might have said, oh, she's okay, you know. She's been here a while, you know. But really, if anyone like this approaches you on the job and starts talking dirt about the company or whatever, um, you better be pretty careful with it, you know? Because, um, again, you know, some of it you probably should know. And this is weird for me to say this because I was, uh, I was uh, an uh, delegated personnel uh, here in France for eight years on a volunteer basis and that meant that I volunteered my time to speak up for employees of my employer and it was all done you know once a month very properly and you know things were noted and everything and it was a big pain in the ass but here in France we're expected to do that at least once and I was elected and I got re-elected and uh was pretty interesting but um, you know I I did several times tell new employees what the deal was with that company 
and I warned them not to do certain things or, you know, and to open their eyes. And actually, um, I felt very guilty every time I did it. And I felt like, oh, I'm just muddying the waters. I should keep my mouth shut and let them figure it out for themselves. But in fact, most of them got back to me and said, my God, you know, you minced your words. I don't know how you were so tactful. You know, thank you for trying to warn me, but, you know, now I know. Now I know that... Uh, you know, this place is like really evil. And this is like slave labor. This was teaching English here in Paris. It's a big international company. And, you know, they were like, wow, you know, you, you should have been even more outspoken. And I said, well, you know, I really felt bad about saying what I did. And I didn't know how you would take it. And I don't really like people who are naysayers and who can become toxic employees and co-workers, you know. But, you know, every situation is kind of different. So anyway, this girlfriend I had in New York, oh, she was a piece of work, you know. I am convinced that she has borderline personality disorder. I mean, you look on the Wikipedia page, that's her. That's her all over. And I am not denigrating our friendship. You know, we had a lot of great chick times together. Any of you ladies might know how cool that can be. But really, her family was very sleazy, and so was she. And actually, uh, I showed some... Uh, what's the word? I kind of held back with her for a couple of years, and I... I didn't really tell her everything about myself, you know. We were ju just kind of lunch buddies at work, and we might go out after work, and, you know, it was... <sighs> Eventually, I told her about myself and opened up to her. And again, you know, I found out more about her and her family and... You know, basically we're we're talking about walking on the wild side here, okay? I don't really want to say anything more than that, but... <clears throat> so for over the next year or so, she was having a lot of problems with the company and uh, was pranking them and doing a lot of really illegal stuff, which actually wasn't that bad because it was Wall Street in the 80s and... Everybody was doing a lot of illegal stuff, okay? A lot of very inappropriate stuff. But um, uh, she ended up leaving. She quit. Uh, she wasn't fired. She quit. But she pranked one of her bosses, who she hated, who was this incompetent fool who had been rousted from Ernst & Winnie in the past for totally ruining some deals and not even being able to keep the books and stuff and he was having this affair with the with the the accountant for our company and uh he was married and it was just a very awkward situation you know he he was a a social climber and he'd come back from lunch after five martinis all trashed and she absolutely hated him and they used to torment each other and one day she went into his office and uh, did some bad stuff in there. And uh, I ended up getting blamed by, for that. And he confronted me, and others at the company did. And I, I just looked at them innocently and said, no. <laughs> you know, I absolutely did not do that. I, I haven't even been in his office I don't go into his office I've never been in his office I don't work for him and no but they didn't believe me and I got blamed for it and it eventually cost me my job after a couple of years and she saw the chief accountant there for the company years later in Midtown Manhattan and she spoke to him and said you know that thing that happened with so and so I did it. 
And he said, oh my God, Lisa took the blame for that. And she said, well, yeah, you know. And But it was years too late. I mean, there was nothing that could be done about it. I had lost my job. I mean, I got blamed for something that she did and I didn't do. And, uh, well, she, she never apologized to me, which is really typical of people with borderline personality disorder and Asperger's syndrome and, you know, stuff like that, you know. They won't even offer a simple apology. And I, I ask you to bear in mind, people, that an apology is not necessarily an admission that, you know, it was really your fault. It's just your regret that it happened. You know, it may or may not have been completely your fault or even not your fault at all but that you're just sorry it happened and a polite person will accept your apology and uh, well in in the United States that I know anyway uh, might condition that with uh, well I accept your apology but you know this was way out of line and you should never do this or that again and you really hurt me and I feel really bad about it you know whatever actually this has been rather hard for me to explain to French people because an apology in France culturally means something rather different anyway uh, she would go in and out of friendship with me you know she would she was always late for things I mean we're talking an hour late and never apologized and she was constantly primping. And she had one bad relationship after another. Long-term ones. I mean, they were just epic. I mean, it was like something out of a Woody Allen movie, you know. And she did everything wrong that a single female could do who wants to get into a marriage or a relationship. Uh, you know, she wore twin sets. You know, she had frosted hair and she permed her hair. She talked in a little high baby voice and she would show photos of her cats to people on the first date and talk about her family. And she would get drunk and have sex with them on the first date. You know, she was just an ambulatory disaster, you know. And as her friend, I tried to talk to her about this. And, um,. It never worked, you know. And she would drop in and out of friendship with me. I mean, she would just go blip. And I wouldn't hear from her from her for like, I don't know, two or three years or something. <clears throat> One year, two years, something like that. And then she would just call and say hi. And this is a really sure sign of, for example, people who have Asperger's Syndrome... They'll just drop out and resurface and they won't apologize and they just expect you to take them back and carry on with them. And I really think that she has borderline personality disorder, which is um, a very sad condition and is frequently the result of neglect and abuse early in life. And these people are victims you know, they'll fail rehab every time. They can be absolutely horrible to have anything to do with. These are very, very toxic people. And they're really suffering. And um, they don't need medication generally. Uh, they need a lot of therapy. Group therapy, talk therapy. And um, they need to know that they're victims, but that this this bullshit will not stand, you know. And God, I mean, oh, she was just insane, you know, shopaholic, and she she was constantly getting pregnant and getting abortions, and you know, drinking, and her family was into drugs, and this whole dysfunctional family thing, and this whole native New Yorker crap, and it was just it was just appalling, you know. And my bad for continuing to be friends with her, okay? I just want to make that clear. 
but I have a very compliant nature. I tend to be very patient, very forgiving. Um, I, I'm told that I'm kind of sweet, and I tend to look out for people and, you know, cut them some slack and try not to be a hypocrite. So, years and years and years went by, and we had a lot of great times together. I mean, really, really great times. But, you know, when I moved to France, well, first of all, she told me that, well, she hated my second husband. And she told me that were I ever to leave him, I could stay in her apartment in Queens for two weeks, no questions asked, any time. So finally, when I did leave him, all of a sudden, you know, Oh, no, I, I can't do that. I'm not available. You know, so I wasn't evo even able to couch surf with her. And I spent six weeks homeless in the, the coldest winter on record in New York City, right? And um, I, I did have a job at that time, thank God. Uh, and when I moved to France I didn't hear from her for a while and then of course she called me up as many other friends did in the United States because you know I was living in Paris and naturally they wanted to visit and stay with me so I became a free hotel for year after year after year and with these American people it was always the same story they would come four times and they would need all this stuff done for them and they would get sick here, and uh, they would break things, and they would act like idiots, and I would explain things to them over and over again, and I ended up being like this free tour guide and servant to give them a great vacation, and, it, it, and then after the fourth visit, you know, I would never hear from them again, really, generally. And she was the same thing, you know, and I was so good to her. My God. She she had, and some of my other friends from the States, had these vacations here that were like out of a movie, okay? Uh, oh, I don't even want to get into that. You know, I really bent over backwards for these friends. And um, so finally she, she called me up one night or one day over here and she was working for a hedge fund in New York totally crooked people making a lot of money and always boasting about it and yet she ended up ripping me off for a hundred dollars right when we last knew each other you know I thought that was really sleazy really sleazy okay and uh, she she said that she had been to the office party for her company and she had sex with a coworker on a desk, and they were really drunk. And she was joking about the fact that she was having sex with these married men, and she didn't use any protection, and she has STDs. And I said to her, I, I cannot condone this behavior, you know. That's messed up, you know. You're not doing good by yourself or anyone else. And... I don't think she liked that. And she ended up dropping out of my life again, again and again. This was like 10 years ago. And apparently she hadn't even told me her actual address for a couple of years before that. She was using a mail drop, and I didn't know that. And boy, is she lucky I did not drop a dime on anyone in her family. Because I know all the criminal stuff that they've been doing for decades. But really, you know, that's all water under the bridge and, you know, it wouldn't accomplish anything and it'd probably be very dangerous for me because these people are frigging scary, believe me. So, yesterday I get this package and I see it's from her. I'm like, oh my God. And I was going to make this video first and then open it and then I open it you know, it's this nice box set of Atlantic Records. And I used to be a DJ. And uh, she was my guest for a couple of radio shows. And it was a lot of fun. And so this is really nice. You know, there there are these four CDs in here and this nice book. And she says, Dear Lisa, 
I found this box set at a Warner Music sale on 52nd Street in New York City. I reminded it. I reminded me. Yeah, she's she's dyslexic. I think she meant it reminded me of the Bikini Hour radio show. So I hope you don't mind my sending it along to you. Warmest wishes, and she signs her name. And I thought, well, this is nice, you know. I'll probably enjoy this a lot. And if I don't like it, I, I can certainly re-gift it. And, uh, but I'm not answering her. I'm not making that mistake again. You know, really, at this point, I have no more contact anymore with friends or family. I don't know who's worse friends or family. I mean, they're just like vampires. They're horrible. And you're you're just, you know, consider yourself as good as dead if you trust any of them or have anything to do with any of them. And I can't believe I sound like this. I turn 57 next month, but really, I mean, this is just this is just how I feel after all these years. And I know that we have to stick up for ourselves and that we shouldn't expect anything in return. You know, desire not the fruits of thy labors, as the Bhagavad Gita says. But when you've been so generous and so supportive and so patient to people for like years and decades, really your whole life in, in many uh, uh, on many occasions you know and they are just not only never there for you but they hassle you and they want you to deal with their shit and pay for it and stuff you know it's just like my god you know how can these people even live with themselves you know my my old girlfriend in New York I say this, you know, F you, you know, I hope you stay single and lonely and miserable and mentally ill and I will not forgive you for what you did to me. You know, it's like the Greek translation of the Bible. Forgive them not, Father, for they know what they do. I don't forgive you. I'm not turning the other cheek. You know, go F yourself you know you and the horse you rode in on and your sleazy family there in New York City criminals and you know I hate you for all the damage you did to me and for how many times I trusted you and took you back and um, in the name of friendship and generosity you know I was good to you and there's no apology here. You know, warmest wishes is not good enough. You could have said, I apologize, you know, for again dropping out for the past decade. But no, no. This was not possible. This just wasn't possible. So, I'm not going to throw this out the window. It's kind of a nice object. But I really don't feel great about this. And for some of my other uh, former friends and family who might see this and you know who you are, you know, I'm still waiting for apologies from you. And I do not wish to deny anything good that you ever did for me or any good times that we had together. But when push comes to shove, you know, I really got treated like dirt. And you think that's okay? You know, you're just a grifter. You're just you're just sleazy. You know, you're just nasty. And to this former girlfriend of mine, I am glad you are out of my life. And um, I'm sure you're going to end up alone and uh, getting very sick again from another STD probably 
And uh, that sounds like a very mean-spirited thing to say, but after 20 years of putting up with you, uh, I know what I'm talking about. And, you know, people really suck. People ruin everything. You know, I don't know who's worse. You know, adults or babies. You know, babies are dirty and they're stupid. But, you know, and people are horrified when I say that. But I've been a nanny. And, you know, if the baby's okay, well, then you've got to deal with its parents who are always disgusting. I don't know who's worse, actually, parents or dog owners. You know, they're just they're just so, so, so awful. And, well, so this is my rant. And this was the package I got in the mail from New York City. And, um, you know, I'm never talking to this one again. That's it. She's not getting any response or anything. This video is too much. But I, I hope that a lot of you have heard me and understood what I am saying here. Because I mean it very, very sincerely. You know, people ruin everything.